1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 23, New Revised Standard Version. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable, th perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He, had de he was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised from the dead and gave him, and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring world, word of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of infinite love, we come before you in this time filled with humility and with gratitude. We ask that though we do not deserve it by the way that we treat one another, that you would continue to be gracious unto us by stirring your spirit of love among us and within us. We ask, O oh God, that you would open our eyes, ears, hearts, and our minds, that you would transform our souls into good fertile soil for the planting of your word of truth, and that we would be obedient to that truth so that that word might grow within us and bear good fruit for the kingdom of God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today, we continue our six-week Easter season sermon series on 1 Peter. Try to say that ten times fast. Six-week Easter season sermon series on the letter that we know as 1 Peter. I'm excited to do this. I planned this uh, quite a long time ago, several months ago, actually. Uh, but in retrospect, as I examine and study the letters I've been doing the last couple of weeks, it, it turns out that it's almost as if this letter was custom written for the circumstances that we now find ourselves. That, that uh, the circumstance of the churches to which Peter was initially writing have some important parallels to where we are today. Now, I'd like to look at that passage that we just heard again from the first chapter of 1 Peter, like we heard from last week. Uh, but I want to focus specifically on one verse, which is verse 22. Now, before we get to verse 22, I kind of want to set the stage or the frame. I, I want to get us all in the right perspective as we examine this text based upon where God has been leading me in studying this particular passage of Scripture. So uh, I've been meditating upon the fact that uh, the reason we are here today, we in the church, the reason that we're here today is because of the specific decisions that previous churches that we considered to be our ancestors made during similar times of crisis. So we're going through a time of crisis, and the church has gone through times of crisis since the beginning of the church. In fact, it was born in a crisis. And because the church uh, that we call our uh, line of ancestry has done certain things and, and made certain decisions, it has endured, it has survived, it has thrived, it has grown stronger. And because of that, we're here today. Now, with that thought comes the truth, the uncomfortable truth, that there are countless traditions within our Christian faith that are extinct, that do not exist anymore, that died out a long time ago, and we wouldn't even know about them because they're gone and they leave no record but it's because they made the wrong decisions and they made unwise decisions during times of crisis that they did not survive or thrive or endure or become stronger. In fact, they disappeared. So to give you a, a short but important example of what that looks like, let's just go to our birth, okay? Let's go to when the church was born. So back in the first century, which is the context for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the early church, you had some very important historical events in that world. And perhaps the most important one, as far as we are concerned, is uh, the destruction of the Jewish temple. 
So there is a temple in Jerusalem, and around the year 70, the Roman armies, after a period of wars with the Jewish people, destroy the temple and burn down the ruins. Now, at that time, this is the important thing I want you to, to recognize, there were all kinds of different sects or uh, denominations of uh, Jewish religion. So uh, kind of like, you know, we have different denominations today within Protestantism, we have different traditions of Protestantism and Roman Catholicism and so forth. In the ancient world, you had a similar situation with the Jewish faith. And there were all these different types of Jews that had the same origin, but they had slightly different beliefs and different practices and ways that they went about being faithful to God. Now, when the temple was destroyed, many of them were thrown into disarray and disorientation because the temple, after all, was the center point of the Jewish universe. It was the place where they believed that God's spirit literally dwelled in the Holy of Holies. They believed that it was the only appropriate, proper place that you could bring your atoning worship. They believed that it was the center of their Jewish uh, economic, social, political, and religious lives. And when the temple was destroyed, the people were thinking, well, what in the world does that mean? Has God mad at us? Has God abandoned us? And, and where do we go from here? And that temple, by the way, has never been rebuilt since. Now, among all of those Jews, there was a small group of Jews who worshipped as Messiah and Son of God, this man named Jesus. And uh, they had some particular beliefs, and they had a particular practice which allowed them to survive this crisis while so many of those other Jewish denominations, if you will, died out, became extinct, and we don't even know about them except for very, very uh, scarce records that exist here and there. Now, what the Christian uh, Jews, well, just, you know, they were this Jewish people that worshiped Jesus, what they believed uh, included two things that were very important. Number one, they believed because of the nature of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that what that me meant is that the covenant of God's people was opened up to all. That God extended God's covenant or promise to all of humanity through Christ, through the death of Christ and through the resurrection of Christ. And that includes not just the circumcision of the flesh or the ethnically Jewish people, but rather Gentiles as well. And what that allowed for was exponential growth of this movement in a context that was filled with Hellenistic culture or Gentile culture. So in that environment, it allowed for the rapid growth of the church. The second thing that they believed that was very, very important is that just because the temple was destroyed did not mean that God's spirit did not dwell among us. What the Christian people believe, what we now know as Christians, is that because the presence of God was especially available in a very special way in the person of Jesus, that Jesus, with his very essence, contained a divinity, that he was 100% God as well as 100% human, that because God dwelt with him and because when you saw the Son, you saw the Father, they believed that when Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven, that that's very same spirit descended into the people and that now the presence of God was in the people. That was their answer. The presence of God is not limited to the temple. The presence of God is in the people. It's in the church. It's not in a geographic location. I just have to pause right there and point out that that's an important lesson for us right now that I hope we're all learning. That the Spirit of God is not particularly present in a space, that it's not a sanctuary, it's not a particular parcel of land that, that only opens up one hour a week where the Spirit of God can dwell. That indeed the Spirit of God is in a people, that the people are the living stones that make up the proverbial temple in which God's Spirit dwells. That was their answer. And because that was their answer, they unlike many of their brethren, were able to survive that time of crisis. And they were able to survive periods of persecution, which brings us to where Peter is writing this letter uh, at the time that we're reading it. So, uh, or, or the time that uh, uh, Peter was writing. So Peter writes this letter around the turn of the second century to a church or a group of churches in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, that are suffering persecution, uh, harassment, clashes with the surrounding culture. These are Gentile churches, meaning that these are people who are native of this land. These, they're, they're home, right? They're, they, were, they were born in this geographic location, but because of their faith, they've become exiled among their own people. They're strangers in a strange land, which is even stranger because it's their land. 
In other words, they've been alienated, they're being harassed, they're being persecuted, they're going through a time of trial. And it's because they obey what Peter says and follow his guidance and direction that they were able to survive and all of us are able to be here today. Just very briefly, I'll give you a negative example of what that looks like. So in the 1920s and 30s, there was something, I forget what the technical name was, the German National Church or, or whatever, but it was um, a church in Germany that was just a Protestant church like any other denomination, and it uh, adopted and affirmed what was called the Fuhrer Principle, meaning that they embraced Adolf Hitler as their supreme leader, even in religious matters. Now, at the time, they clearly would have thought that they made the right decision because they were very close with the prevailing political power of that day, who, uh, who was Hitler and this, this would-be conqueror. But in retrospect, we all know that what indeed happened, that they cozy up to evil, and because of that, they are extinguished from the face of the earth. There is no tradition that is descended from the National Church of Germany, or whatever it was called. And in fact, I believe, just as a side note, I don't know if I'm 100% right about this, it's, it's debatable I suppose, but I can't help but think that one of the reasons that the church is more or less extinct on the continent of Europe is because of the way in which many of those communities responded or didn't respond during the uh, upheaval and death and destruction of the 20th century. I, I guess that's for academic uh, folks to decide. But anyway, so let's bring it back to the current day. So, so we're going through uh, a time of trial, okay? Americans, the American church, First Christian Church Danville, we are going through a time of stress and suffering, an age of anxiety, where we're going through this season in which we have a lot of uncertainty and, and a lot of uh, uh, unknowns and a lot of fear going on. And the question is, and this is, this is the frame of the, of, the, of the text that I want to look at, the question is, Will the church of 50 or 100, 500 or 1,000 years from now look back and see us as their spiritual ancestors? Or will we be one more negative example about what not to do in a crisis? Well, I think that's a good question. Let's look at what the text says. So first Peter says in this Verse 22 of that passage, 1 Peter 17 through 23, he says, Now that you have purified yourselves. Now, what does that mean to purify yourselves? To purify yourselves, specifically, he says, to purify your souls. Okay? Soul is not just that invisible spirit inside of the meat of your body. Your soul, according to the ancient Greek conception, was the entire person. The soul was the totality of the mental, physical, spiritual, emotional dimensions of your being. The soul was your entire being. And he says, now that your souls have been purified, what does it mean to be purified? Well, well first of all, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Because earlier in the letter, a part that we didn't see, Peter says to the church, now be holy, be God's holy people, just as God is holy. And when we look at that, just like we look in Matthew chapter 5, when uh, Jesus says that you should be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect, there's a potential for us to misunderstand that. To be holy as God is holy, to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, does not mean that we become God. It does not mean that we become flawless with all the power of God. It doesn't mean that we just become a miniature microcosm of God. That's not what that means. It means that we become holy as God is holy that we adopt a perfection in terms of our adherence to a purpose or goal as God has done. In other words, it is to be purely and completely who and what we really are. So God is God is God and nothing else. God is not mostly God's substance mixed up with a little bit of something else. No, God is purely God. God is totally God. There's nothing else that's not God mixed in with God. That's what that means. So we are to be a holy people in that we are to be pure, purified of everything that is not us. So we are something, we have this substance, we have this essence that comes from God, and living in this world, we become too affiliated or identified with this world, and we become mixed up with greed. We become mixed up with pride and arrogance. We become mixed up with conflict, with resentment, with despair. We become mixed up with all of these worldly concerns because we falsely believe that these worldly concerns are that which establish our value, purpose, and meaning in life. We become mixed up with all of these things. And what 
First Peter is saying to this community is that you have to be purified of all of those things. You need to remove everything in you that is not you. Just like you would take uh, gold ore and you would refine that gold by removing everything, all the minerals that are not gold until all you have left is the pure metal substance. That is what it means to be purified. So now that your souls have been purified, how? Well, he says right there, this, this is what he says next. This is how you purify your souls. This should be good uh, uh, instruction to all of us. He says, now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Obedience to the truth. Well, what is the truth? Well, the truth is expressed in this passage and in the passage that we heard before. And the truth is that we are of an imperishable substance. In this letter right here, it says that you need to remember that you were ransomed, that you were saved, that you are redeemed, not with perishable valuables like silver and gold, but rather with an imperishable value, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the shed blood of an imperishable uh, treasure, such as the blood of Jesus Christ, which redeemed you from your sin. And the reason that it had to be that, the reason that God couldn't use silver and gold to redeem you, is because you come from an imperishable seed. And that imperishable seed is because God uh, knew of you since the beginning of the foundation of the world. In other words, what it says in the text here is that since the foundations of the world, that Christ was uh, planning to uh, redeem you for your sin. That this was a part of God's plan from the very beginning. In other words, your life and death doesn't begin and end with that birth and death date that you put on your tombstone. That rather, your being, your essence was present in the mind of God since before creation. And if that's where you come from. If you come from the creative mind of God that was present before anything came into being, then you come from an imperishable seed. That is your foundation. That is your origin. That is why you are not of the perishable stuff in this world. That is why we are above all of the nonsense and the conflict of this world. Let me tell you something. I'm so glad that we have this stress and anxiety going on. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not glad that people are suffering and dying. I'm not glad that people have lost their jobs. I'm not glad for a lot of the pain that people are enduring. I'm glad for the atmosphere of stress and anxiety because it makes potential this possibility of purification. What happens is we have inside of us all of this conflict and all of these character defects and all of these things about us that we harbor. We harbor greed. We harbor pride. We harbor arrogance. We harbor conflict, resentment, anger. We harbor all of these things that are beneath us, inside of us. But because we can get through life with them, we do. And the way that we do it is we put this layer, this facade on top of it, and we go about our lives. Then something like this happens, and that layer, that surface, that facade comes bubbling off and it dissolves. And now all of that stuff underneath this is exposed. Some people would say that's the worst coming out of us, that crises, crises will bring out the worst in people. I would just say that it exposes what's really going on. But that's good news. This is why I'm grateful. Now we have an opportunity to face and be rid of those character defects inside of us. Now we can get rid of that pride, that arrogance, that, that resentment. Now we can look at it and we can see how these things inside of us that we have been harboring, that we've been giving shelter to, are hurting the people that we love most in the world. Same thing happens with society. We're going, undergoing pressure, uh, stress, anxiety, and that reveals all of this conflict that was just underneath the surface. It's now exposed and now we have to face it. But that's not all a bad thing because we can purify ourselves by removing that which is not us. We can take out of ourselves all those things that are not what we really, really are. And what God says is what you are, what you come from, is an imperishable seed. It's imperishable by nature. You come from the mind of God and the creative mind of God since before creation even happened. And if we remember from last week's text, you have an imperishable inheritance waiting for you in heaven that no inflation can degrade the base currency value of. You have an imperishable inheritance that is union with your creator waiting for you in heaven. So you come from something infinitely in the past and you are going to somewhere infinitely in the future, which means that you are of the substance, the eternal substance that God has deemed not 
of all of this stuff in the world. So we have to uh, remove all of that stuff from ourselves. Now, what is the proof that this has happened? Okay, because all, of, all these things that I've been saying is very theoretical. Okay, get rid of the stuff that isn't us. Okay, we understand you. you know, get rid of the, the pride. Get rid of the arrogance. Get rid of the, uh, you know, the, the fear. Get rid of all the resentment. Okay, I, I hear you, but, but what's, the, what's the proof that that has happened? What does that actually look like? Well, let me show you because it says right here in the text. It says, so that you have genuine, mutual love. Let's look at those things in reverse. Love is that force that comes from God that holds us together. Love is that bond between us that is unbound by someone else's will, that is unbound by someone else's desire. That love is a free will expression of connection between people. Mutual love means that it isn't just one saint in the church that loves the rest of us who are acting like fools. Okay, that's not evidence of what purification that a congregation must endure. Okay, the evidence that we have undergone the, pur the purification that is going to ensure that we make it through and that we become the spiritual ancestors of the church of the future is that our love is mutual. Okay, so it's not just one person who loves us despite all our craziness, but rather that we love each other, that the love is mutual, that we love each other no matter who we are, that there is no hierarchy, that there is no uh, better or worse, that the love is between Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, black and white, rich and poor, those who are privileged, those who are underprivileged, everyone in between. If that love is mutual, that is evidence of the purification that our congregation has undergone. And is genuine. Another word for genuine is unhypocritical. What does that mean? It means that uh, if you look at the situation of the people in this church that 1 Peter is addressed to, they are uh, being harassed by the outside, okay? They are being persecuted from the outside. They have this culture clash with the culture around them. And because of that, there would be plenty of opportunities for people to turn other people in. There would be plenty of opportunities for betrayal. And what this text is saying is that if it's genuine mutual love, that it is love that will resist and overcome any of those inferior forces that try to pull us apart. So if we stick with each other through thick and thin, if we stick with each other no matter what, if we stick with each other no matter what the governor or the president or NBC or CBS or ABC or CNN or MSNBC or Fox News said, if we stick with each other no matter what somebody posts on Facebook or tweets on Twitter, if we stick with each other through them, that our love is genuine mutual love. Genuine mutual love cannot be broken by anything else. That is how we will make it through. That is a sign that we have been purified and that we will persevere this time of trial. This is how we know that we will be the ones that our, that our descendants will look back upon us and call their ancestors. And then it says what we are. Because after all, if you've been purified, then you become what you really are. If you've been purified and everything that is not us has been taken out of us, what is left, it is what is truly, purely us. And you want to know what that is? Well, if you go back to the beginning of creation, you will see that there is a force that called all things into being that came from God. If you go further on in the story, when everything had gone off the rails, there was a force that was inside of God that came from God that motivated a saving activity that washed this world clean. When people were languishing in slavery, bondage in Egypt for 400 years, the cries of the people rise up to the ears of God and there was a force inside of God that was animated that God used to liberate God's people. It was that same force that guided them across a wilderness. It was that same force that stood in the middle of the road when God's people had wandered off like a wayward child, waiting for that lost son or daughter to return home. It was that love that whispered in a little girl named Mary's ear and said, I choose you because no one else chooses you to be the one who brings salvation into the world. It was that force, that power that was inside of God that lived through the life of Christ. 
that brought him close to those who were marginalized, that healed those who were sick, that walked on water, multiplied food, and raised the dead. It was that same very force that stood him up against Pilate and caused him to resist the temptations of the devil to save his own life, but rather to be obedient to his Father in heaven. It was that same force that held him to a cross. It was the same force that raised him from the grave. It's the same force that came from heaven when the skies were ripped open and the Holy Spirit poured into all of us, making us the church. And that force is called, you know it, it's called love. And it's what we are when we have been purified from everything that we are not. God's children are pure, unadulterated love. And that's why we can make it through. That's how we shall endure. That's how we shall thrive, survive, and persevere. Because we are love. And if we remember who we are, then they certainly shall remember us. But if we forget, and if we betray, and if we descend into this perishable nonsense that we see all around us, succumbing to these lesser forces, then God help us. Amen.